Somebody could be tracking you through your headphones. Find out how. So Andy, your story has me a little frightened considering that I'm wearing headphones right now. So uh, tell us a little more about this being, being able to be tracked through your headphones. You can't hide, George. <laughs> <laughs> we'll know where you are. Uh, but it was a great story. So there's a, um, I I've never heard of it, but NRK is a publishing house in, Nor in Norway. It's like the state run publishing house. Um, they have a kind of a subsidiary called NRK Beta, which is focused on technology. So that's where this story was posted um, because there was a Norwegian researcher uh, for school who actually put, all, put together this research. So essentially his project was a lot like, um, you guys know what tile is? The little tiles thing and um, Apple just started doing it with their, what are they called? The little find my devices? I, I button. Air tags. Air, Air tags. tags. Yes. tags. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a lot like that in that it, it uses Bluetooth low energy to figure out where a device is. You know, devices are just pinging out constantly. Um, and then anything locally will find it and then it'll report it back. And that's how you'll be able to see where it is kind of based on that that's kind of how it works. So I'm, I'm being a little bit uh, reductive. <laughs> I'm washing over a lot of details here. The article itself actually goes into a fair amount of detail, but um, there, it is linked his actual write up for his research, and there's tons more details. He goes into you know exactly what he did, how he did it, how he found you know all of the data and all that stuff, and he even goes into like what a MAC address is because that's essentially how this works. Um, so I, I recommend if you're interested, go to his actual uh, post in, on his website. I should probably say his name um, if I can say it right because it is Norwegian. His name is Bjorn Martin Hegnes. I'm saying that right. I think it's it's correct. So you know, hegnest.tech is his website. You can go uh, check out this details. But so he built this thing. Um, it, it's a Raspberry Pi. It's a you know Wi-Fi adapter. It's a external battery, uh, physical GPS module, and then a physical time module. And he has it all in this little package. And there's a neat picture of him on that article uh, that shows him holding it. It looks rad. And he's essentially war driving, um, which is where, you know, you get in a car and you drive around and you look for Wi-Fi networks, uh, essentially, you start trying to hack things. Um, he did it on a bike, because he's from Norway, I assume. And he was actually looking for Bluetooth signals and whatnot. So he did this over the course of, I think it was a couple, like 12 days or something on his bike. And what he found was that using the MAC addresses of, of you know, pings and beacons that were going out, Sometimes they were associated with actual host names or like SSIDs. Um, he could actually track some, like specific devices. So a MAC address is supposed to be unique. It's something that identifies, it's like a physical hardware identifier for, you know, NICs and whatnot. And, you know, he would find, he would, he would capture uh, the data for one of them here. And then maybe two days later, he would capture the same device somewhere else. And so that sort of means he's tracked you. He kind of knows where you are at that, at that point. Um, and he knows your your movements at least. So obviously it's a proof of concept. You would need to do it on a much larger scale to truly track someone. But I think he did it. I think he proved that it's possible to do it in that manner, um, which of course brings up a privacy concern because you know in his research he found phones, he found headphones, he found laptops, he found you know Bluetooth headsets, speakers, uh, wearables, you know. <laughs> A lot of different things are pinging out using Bluetooth low energy. And so a lot of different things are able to be, you know, they're just sending information out to the ether. Also, that that hardware does look rad. Uh, it looks cool. <laughs> and it's not terribly it's not terribly complex to, to set up. I mean, he's using Kismet. If, if you've done any sort of Wi-Fi hacking, Kismet is like the first thing you use. It's just it just uh, it finds networks for you, even hidden networks, because obviously Wi-Fi networks have to send out these beacons and these frames and because just will grab them for you and then you know organizes them in a, in a, in a nice table um, i think he mentioned he spent three thousand krone norwegian krone so he, yeah he mentioned the whole project hardware wise took three thousand krone which translates to like i don't know three hundred dollars in american dollars or something i think is what it was no 30 wait hold on sorry yeah like 350 bucks 
in in American dollars. And it's really it's just it's not terribly complicated hardware. You've got the Pi, you've got the adapter, and some of the stuff that he had in there too was you know, like the hardware uh, time, mm -hmm. hardware GPS module. Those things can be pretty cheap as well. Um, but it looks pretty cool. I would, I mean, check it out. Yeah, this is cool. I think what's a what's a great takeaway from this um, is how he mentions a few times. I'm warning against using your first and last name on your Bluetooth devices and your Wi-Fi routers. Which I don't know about Wi-Fi routers who would do that, but I guess Bluetooth devices like you know, it would say like you know Andy's headset, or George's headset. Like I think yeah. it's a good way to it's a good. It's something good to know. It's something very basic, but something everybody can kind of do just to not be concerned with somebody tracking them like he is. Yeah. Um, but the, the the point is the same. Understand that what you name your pair of headphones or what you name your headset or even your watch or whatever it may be, that data is being sent out and it could potentially be used to track your whereabouts if someone is an interested party. So that's a, that's a great takeaway, George. Yeah, yeah that's interesting. Um, I know that I think Apple has decided to start using like temporary Bluetooth MAC addresses and temporary Wi-Fi MAC addresses for this exact reason. Um, it's yep. probably a little uh, easier because they're the host in most connections. Um, or the, how do you say it? For Bluetooth, they're the host, right? Um, yep. I wonder how that changes the whole pairing process. So starting in iOS 14, uh, Apple decided that all iOS devices moving forward, we actually have Mac randomization. So that means that every time it tries to reach out for anything that it's that is unfamiliar to it, something that it hasn't paired with before, it'll use a random Mac. Now, something that it that it recognizes, like you know, your headphones or something that you've connected to in the past, it'll use the actual Mac address um, for practicality reasons. But anything else, it actually won't it won't do that. And I think it's also on it was Mac OS, I think the latest version that's out right now, because it's a relatively new thing. Um, so if you have older devices running old software, older software, yet another reason to upgrade your software because it, it includes this sort of protection. Um, and I think in his research, he did, note, he did note that of the different mobile devices that he uncovered, Apple was among uh, those devices. Um, but I think he mentioned something about how there, was, there were lower in numbers overall than some of the other devices. It is in Norway, so that might play a fact as well. Uh, that might play into it. But you also have to consider that some people don't like upgrading their software for fear of bugs or performance hits. So maybe what we're seeing is just, you know, iPhones on iOS 13. That's just something that happens. He also mentioned in his research that um, he found some cars as well, because of course cars these yeah. days. And not just Teslas. I mean, even older cars. You know, you can put in a different a Bluetooth radio in a car, and that'll do the same thing. So, uh, just be so, be cognizant of that sort of thing. I have a, a quick story I'll throw in here as far as the Bluetooth connection on cars that happened to me. Um, there was a point in time where I was in between cars, and I was renting a lot of cars. Right, so I was setting up the the car Apple Car Player or whatever the Bluetooth connection in the cars to my phone. And I would return the cars. And in one case, a um, co-worker of mine had rented the same car. And he had paired his phone with that car, I guess, previously, never unpaired it. And I was driving right in front of the building where, where we worked. And he was happened to be walking by. And as soon as I drove past him, my phone call cut out. And I got his phone call in my car. And started hearing that person talking to me, and this went on for about half of a block. And I'm like, "What just happened?" And then all of a sudden, it, it reverted back to my call, and I found out his phone paired with the car while I was dr literally driving past him at about five miles an hour. So, um, yeah, Bluetooth can be a very interesting uh, thing people forget about, like simple things like you have to just completely remove your device from whatever temporary use you're using it. You know, from a vehicle, from, you know, anything that you're using that you're not going to keep for a while. Don't name it Andy's, you know, phone <laughs> or Andy's car or whatever. Yeah, I've, I've heard the same thing with rental cars. Where, you know, yeah, it's... I'll pop up with a rental car and you'll scroll through and there'll be like 10 other phones. Some of them have names, some of them don't. Um, 
getting a little off topic on the Bluetooth, um, there's also some of these cars have features that allow you to see where the car is because they assume it's a car and you've paired your phone. Therefore, you're probably the owner, not yeah. for a rental car. Um, so there's all sorts of things that you could potentially do. And if there's things like the ability to start the car remotely and put the heat on, um, those things have not been removed. Then yeah. anybody who's ever been in the driver's seat and paired their phone has that access. Um, that's real interesting too. But getting back to your to your headphone stuff, I mean, do we think we have a, a viable solution for this? Have there been vendors of, of headphones that have come up with a viable solution, and, and what is it? I have, I don't know the, I don't know that he goes into any sort of detail on uh, any sort of solutions because it's not just one vendor, it's not one particular headphone maker. It's kind of the way Bluetooth works in a sense. But I think. I was just doing a little bit of, of research on it, and I think as an industry, just uh, as a whole, we're moving toward Mac randomization. I say that because if you look, I mean, Apple just did it with iOS 14. They did it with their Mac OS and, uh, of course, iPad OS. And then Windows, actually, I think in Windows, is it Windows 8? Uh, it was, you could have, it was, it was available, but it was turned off by default. And then in Windows 10, it's available, and sorry, Windows 10, it's available, but off by default, it's disabled. I actually have to go into my settings and enable it. And then I think in Windows 11, it's actually going to be turned on by default, same way that Apple's got its stuff going. And I think it was the same thing with Linux. You could see it was it was like off or just like it wasn't available, wasn't available, wasn't available, and then available, but disabled by default. So it's starting to move toward Mac randomization. I mean, that's just going to, it's just going to depend on manufacturers, you know, deciding to do that if mm -hmm. enough people care about it, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wonder what, what it is. Yeah, people are going to have to care about it and then it's going to have to be easy enough for a developer to include that in their existing code. And yeah, yeah there's a few moving parts, but yeah. Yeah, well, real interesting story. Yeah. But it's not, I mean, it's not the first Bluetooth bug we've seen. I mean, especially yeah. even, with App, even with Apple. I mean, just a little while ago, we had the, uh, the airdrop thing, you know, where someone can can see your name and your phone number. I think that's what it was. Mm -hmm. If you had air, airdrop enabled, just because, like, the hash that was sent wasn't strong enough and it was crackable, mm -hmm. things like that. So the I remember with that story, the, the recommended fix, I think it came from Apple, was, hey, this is the feature, not a bug. The fix was turn off airdrop when you're in a public place. You know? Yeah. Well, that's interesting. I mean, I've that's one of those things you have to really be on top of, though. Like most people yeah. aren't going to like think I'm leaving my house. I have to go three menus deep on my phone every time. Right. And, and, yeah. turn it off. and there's there's reasons why you would want to do it as like a, a geolocation thing. Like some people have it set up mm -hmm. on their phones. As soon as you bring your phone home, it's in home mode. It's a little more trusting of the networks. It's a little more open. You take it out of home, and then all of a sudden. But that's, I think that's few and far between. Those are the folks who are already probably willing to do three menus deep on their phone when they leave their house. They just wanted to do it their way a little bit better. Mm -hmm. um, but I do wonder if that's going to be something. There's got to be some way it can tell it's in a relatively safe place as opposed to out in the wild. And even being, yeah. even if you're like, if you're living in New York City and you're in an apartment building there, um, from a wireless perspective, there's no truly safe place that you're going to be. Yeah. You're not going to come home and put your phone in the microwave. Don't turn it off. But like yeah. the phone in the microwave, so it's not going to you know, right. basically in a Faraday cage at that point. Yeah, that's that's still not really feasible for the majority of people, I think. Yeah, yeah. and I, I like I like what you said about um, I mean all the call the car stories with George and everything because. I mean, you look at these newer cars like Teslas. They have a, they have a card. It's not they don't have a key anymore. Mm -hmm. And then like the new um, Ford just came out with a new electric vehicle as well. And I, I was really I was watching a review on it, and they don't even give you a key. Everything's app based. Mm -hmm. Like you unlock the car with your app. I mean, there's like physical ways of doing it as well in case the app fails. But just this dependence on devices and this implicit trust of ownership, like you said, hey. Yeah. You have the app. You must be my owner. Well, someone stole my phone, though. Yeah. Well, so it's like, yeah. There's just all these different sort of loopholes in it, and I can only imagine that. I mean, we're already. I already see cars moving toward that sort of non-key technological future, and unfortunately, security is always behind. It's always a couple steps behind as it moves forward. 
So I don't know, man. I, I don't want to. I think it's. I think we're going to see more. <laughs> is I guess my ultimate point here. Yeah. Yeah. Purely digital access control still worries me, and I don't think too many people have it down completely, which is why you still have bypasses, physical bypasses for stuff. Um, yeah. Who knows. Okay.